Okay, so for this deep dive, we're going to be looking at something pretty captivating, even if it didn't quite work out in the end. The Soviet Union's lunar program. You know, it was hidden away for such a long time and only really came to light as the Soviet Union was ending. It's sort of a fascinating counterpoint to what the Americans were doing with Apollo. And you've given me a lot of material on this. It's a real saga of ambition and some pretty big technical challenges. Yes, very much so. I think what's particularly interesting is just how big the Soviet ambition was, the different ways they considered doing it, and crucially, you know, why they didn't get a cosmonaut onto the moon despite their early successes in space. Exactly. So for those of you listening, what we're going to do is take apart this Soviet aim to get to the moon. We'll look at the different programs they tried, the crewed flyby attempts, and the landing program itself. And very importantly, we'll be looking closely at the launch vehicles, especially that massive but ultimately ill-fated N1 rocket. By the end, you should have a really solid understanding of why the Soviets didn't quite make it to the lunar surface, despite being so committed to spaceflight. I think a really important thing to remember right from the start is the historical context. You know, back in 1959, the Soviets were already looking into whether a super heavy lift launch vehicle was feasible. That's right. These very early explorations were happening even before the U.S. had really decided to go for a moon landing. Exactly. Then, in May 1961, the Americans announced this very audacious objective to land a man on the moon before the end of the decade. And what's quite amazing is that around the same time, a Soviet report seems to have laid out plans for the first test launch of their answer, the N-1 rocket, as early as 1965. So from the very beginning, it was very much a competition, very heavily influenced by political motivations. I mean, it wasn't just about scientific curiosity. It was much more about demonstrating global technological supremacy. Oh, absolutely. And right at the heart of the Soviet plan to get to the moon was the N-1 rocket. This was their version of the Saturn V, designed to take cosmonauts beyond Earth orbit. All right, so let's delve into this N-1. Now, the version that was specifically aimed at the moon race was the N-1L3. Yeah. And its purpose was very clear, to compete directly with Apollo and land a person on the moon. Mm. A truly remarkable thing about the N1 was its first stage, what they called Block A. Right. It had an incredible 30 NK-15 engines. And for over 50 years, that was the most powerful rocket stage ever to have flown. An incredible feat of engineering, even if it turned out to be its main weakness, you know? To give you an idea of the scale, the American Saturn V's first stage, while it's huge, had just five engines, although each was individually much larger and more powerful. Managing 30 at the same time was an unprecedented engineering challenge. 30 engines. It's hard to imagine how complicated it must have been to manage that. I know. And this first stage was part of the three-stage setup. It was all about getting the whole L3 complex into low Earth orbit. Exactly. And the L3 payload itself was pretty complicated. It had a stage for translunar injection to get it towards the moon, and then another stage for getting into lunar orbit and starting the descent. And there was the LK lander with a single pilot for the final descent to the lunar surface. And then the Soyuz 7K LK with two pilots, which was designed to stay in lunar orbit so they could come back to Earth. Think of the LK as being similar to the Apollo lunar module and the Soyuz 7K LOK, a bit like the command and service modules, although with some key differences in how they worked. So a broadly similar approach to Apollo in terms of the lunar orbit rendezvous, hmm. but there was a major difference, wasn't there? The transfer from the orbital craft to the lander. Yes. The Soviet plan was for a cosmonaut to move from the LOK to the LK by doing a spacewalk. The Americans with Apollo used an internal tunnel. It's one of those design choices that really highlights the different engineering approaches of the two programs. I mean, that spacewalk in the vacuum of space was a much more risky thing to do. Now, despite all this ambition and engineering expertise, the N1 program is mainly remembered for its string of failures. All four uncrewed test launches, which took place between 1969 and 1972, ended before they should have. Let's look at these unfortunate events in more detail. The very first launch, N-13L, in February 1969, what happened there? Well, the first launch unfortunately ran into a whole series of problems, which started in the engine control system, the cord system. A temporary voltage problem caused one of the first stage engines to shut down early. Then the cord system, trying to keep the thrust evenly distributed, shut down another engine. And then on top of that, there was something called pogo oscillation in another engine. Pogo oscillation is a type of vibration in the rocket's structure and propellant system, a bit like a pogo stick bouncing uncontrollably, and it can cause damage and fuel leaks. In this case, it led to a fuel leak and a fire. 
In the end, the court system thought that electrical arson from the fire was a problem with the turbo pump and ordered a complete shutdown of the first stage just 68 seconds into the flight. And to make things worse, the frequency that the court operated at was actually the same as some of the vibrational modes in the rocket, so it made the problem even worse. A very bad start. Then in July 1969, they launched N15L. That one sounds even more dramatic. Sadly, it was. This time, the liquid oxygen LOX turbo pump in one of the first stage engines, engine number eight, exploded before it even lifted off. The shockwave broke vital fuel lines, which led to a huge fire that spread very quickly. Goodness me. This fire then caused most of the other engines on the first stage to shut down one by one. Interestingly, one engine actually kept working until it hit the ground. This failure also did a huge amount of damage on the ground, basically destroying the launch pad. So a big setback, not just for the rocket program, but for their ability to launch anything else from there. So a setback not just for the program, but for their ability to launch other missions. Oh. Then we move on to June 1971 and the N16L launch. What was the main reason for that failure? The third launch had serious problems with aerodynamic instability right at the beginning of the ascent. Very soon after liftoff, the rocket started to roll in a way that was totally unplanned and uncontrolled, probably because of unexpected air currents interacting with the bottom of the first stage. The roll rate very quickly became too much for the rocket's guidance system to handle, and in the end, the structure just broke apart. Although the quarter system would eventually have shut everything down because the flight path was so wrong, it actually disintegrated before that command could be executed. So completely different sort of problem, which shows how difficult it was to deal with the flight dynamics of such a big and unusual design. The completely different problem, uh -huh. showing just how complex it was to manage the flight of something this big and unusual. Finally, we come to the fourth and last test launch, N-17L, in November 1972. This final attempt came down to big problems with the rocket's hydraulic system. The planned step-by-step -step shutdown of the six core engines in the first stage, which was meant to happen about 90 seconds into the flight, produced unexpectedly high dynamic loads and a really big hydraulic shock wave in the fuel lines. This shock wave caused important fuel lines to burst, which led to a fire and an explosion in one of the engines, and eventually the first stage structure breaking up. A rather grim list of failures, really, and each one seems to have come from a different fundamental engineering challenge. A grim list, with each failure seeming to stem from a different fundamental engineering problem. It really paints a picture of a project wrestling with some very serious technical difficulties. And something that's pointed out in the material you've given me is that they made a critical mistake in their development process. They never did a static test firing of the whole first stage with all 30 engines working at the same time. That was a very significant factor, yes. Because they didn't test all 30 engines together on the ground as a complete system for a full duration, they missed really important chances to find and fix problems. You know, things like how vibrations would affect the complex engine cluster, how the fuel would flow through those complicated systems, and how the exhaust plumes from the engines would interact. It seems they just couldn't properly recreate the massive stresses and conditions of a real launch in their ground testing facilities. This lack of complete integrated stage testing is very different to the rigorous approach the Americans had with the Saturn V. It does seem like a major flaw in their testing, especially when you compare it with the more thorough approach the Americans had with the Saturn V. The cord engine control system is mentioned in the sources again and again as a source of problems mm. across many launches. Yes, that's true. The cord system, which had this enormous job of managing 30 separate engines, unfortunately had some design flaws. And I think you could say its programming logic wasn't very well thought out. It often struggled to react properly and quickly to individual engine failures. And as we saw with the first launch, it was even affected by the rocket's own vibrations, which made things worse. For the fourth and last launch attempt, they actually brought in a new digital control system, the S530, for the upper third stage. But the first stage was still using the cord system, and as we've seen, that flight also ended in disaster. It really shows just how bold they were to try and control so many engines with the level of technology that was available back then. The sources also talk about the differences in the overall development and testing approaches between the N1 and the American Saturn V. The N1 program began much later, nearly four years after the Saturn V. And from many accounts, it was constantly underfunded and had a really rough development schedule. And as we've said, that comprehensive full stage testing, which was so vital to the success of the Saturn V, was just missing. Even basic things like how the rockets were transported and assembled were very different. 
The huge stages of the Saturn V could be easily transported by barge to Cape Canaveral, but the much bigger N1 had to be taken in sections by rail to Baikonur in Kazakhstan and assembled horizontally at the launch complex. That made integrated system-level testing much more difficult. So although they clearly had the ambition, the foundations and the thoroughness of the testing just don't seem to have been up to the sheer scale of the engineering task they'd set themselves. Now, alongside this ambitious but unsuccessful moon landing program, the Soviets also had a separate program for a crewed lunar flyby, which is codenamed Zond. Yes. The Zond program was a separate but related effort, and it used the Soyuz 7K L1 spacecraft, which was launched by the Proton rocket, a much more reliable rocket. The main idea behind Zond was something called a free return trajectory around the moon. So the spacecraft wouldn't go into lunar orbit, but would follow a path that took it around the far side of the moon and then straight back to Earth. That sort of path, although in an emergency situation, was famously used by the American Apollo 13 mission. We did see a similar trajectory used by Apollo 13, although under rather more urgent circumstances. And the Zond program included some uncrewed test flights, didn't it? Zond 4 through to Zond 8. Yes, it did. And these early flights weren't completely without problems, especially during re-entry when the spacecraft was coming back into the Earth's atmosphere at very high speed. However, Zon 5, which launched in September 1968, achieved something really important. It carried the first Earth life forms, a couple of tortoises, among other biological specimens on a journey around the moon, and brought them back to Earth safely. A remarkable achievement in itself. Remarkable indeed. It seems they even had a crewed Zond mission planned at one point. Yes, there was a mission planned for December 1968. They were clearly in a bit of a hurry to try and get a crewed flight around the moon before the Americans did, but there were worries about whether the Zond spacecraft and the Proton launch vehicle were ready, so they canceled the crewed mission. And when the Americans succeeded with Apollo 8 in December 1968, becoming the first crewed mission to orbit the moon, the momentum behind the Soviet Zond program seems to have faded. Exactly. Once the Americans achieved that incredibly important milestone, the main political motivation behind Zond had gone, and the program was officially ended by the end of 1970. The Americans had, without a doubt, won that particular stage of the space race. It's fascinating to see these two programs running side by side, each dealing with its own technical challenges and pursuing its own goals. And apart from the N-1 and the Proton Zond projects, the Soviets were also looking at other launch vehicles for lunar missions, weren't they? Oh, absolutely. In the early planning stages, there were ideas about using multiple Soyuz rockets to assemble a bigger lunar mission package while it was still in Earth orbit. Vladimir Chelome, who was a big rival to Sergei Korolev in the Soviet space program, also had ambitious plans for both crewed flights around the moon and moon landings. These were based on his powerful UR-500 rocket, which became the Proton, and the even bigger UR-700 heavy lift vehicle. And of course, smaller and more reliable rockets like the Luna and Molnia were vital to the success of the robotic Luna program, which achieved a number of important lunar firsts. So they had a whole range of rockets being considered and used for different parts of lunar exploration. Which brings us nicely to the main question we're trying to answer. Why did the Soviets ultimately fail to get a cosmonaut on the moon? Well, as we've been discussing, the repeated catastrophic failures of the N-1 rocket were the main technical obstacle. It was meant to be the launch vehicle for the crewed landing mission, and because it wasn't reliable, that ambitious goal just couldn't be achieved in the politically charged time frame of the space race. And the political landscape changed quite dramatically after the American moon landing in the summer of 1969. That's very true. Once the United States had achieved that incredibly important event, the intense political pressure that was driving the Soviet lunar program went down quite a lot. The absolute need to be the first nation to land humans on the moon was no longer there. And the technical problems they had while developing the N-1, combined with the reports of not enough funding and a development schedule that was perhaps too rushed, must have had a very big impact on the final outcome. Absolutely. Trying to develop and perfect such a complex rocket system with so many new technological innovations in such a short space of time and without the huge amounts of money the Americans had for Apollo was always going to be a massive, if not impossible, task. And Sergei Korolev, who died in 1966, was such a key figure in Soviet rocketry. His death must have been a huge blow to the whole program. Yes, his loss was enormous. Korolev not only had the vision for these incredibly ambitious projects, but he also had the political influence to get the support they needed and make them happen. Vesely Machin, who took over from him, 
sadly faced an even more difficult situation. He just didn't have the same level of authority or political clout. In the end, the N-1 program was officially stopped in 1974, which effectively put an end to the Soviet Union's ambition of landing a person on the moon. And it seems that Soviet space exploration then moved in a different direction. Yes, the focus shifted to developing and running crewed space stations in low Earth orbit. At the same time, they were doing some early research and development on potential future crewed missions to Mars. This meant that the resources they needed, money and people, and the strong political will to go for another moon landing just weren't there anymore. The sources also suggest that there wasn't much interest in the Soviet Union in simply copying what the Americans had done on the moon from a technical and scientific point of view. That's a very good point. The Soviet Union had always taken pride in finding its own innovative ways to explore space. Simply repeating what the Americans had already done on the moon might not have had the same scientific value or national prestige, especially given the considerable technical challenges that still needed to be overcome. And of course, there was the economic reality. Some later ambitious ideas for setting up permanent lunar bases were seen as just too expensive. So it was a combination of things, technical and political, that stopped the Soviet Union from landing a cosmonaut on the moon. But even though they didn't ultimately succeed, these lunar programs left a very interesting legacy. Absolutely. Even though the N-1 rocket didn't work out in the end, the program was kept very secret until the late 1980s during Glasnost and Perestroika. They actually developed a better, more advanced version of the rocket, the N-1F, with more powerful and reliable engines. But unfortunately, it never got to fly before the whole N-1 program was canceled. And those NK engines, despite the early problems they had with the N-1, did eventually find successful applications in later years, didn't they? They did, yes. The NK-33 engines, which were very reliable and originally developed for the N-1F, were later used in the American Antares rocket. That rocket has successfully resupplied the International Space Station. And a lighter version of the Russian Soyuz rocket also used engines based on that same design. So all that engineering work that went into those powerful engines wasn't wasted. And we're now seeing a modern continuation of Russian lunar exploration with the Lunaglob robotic program, which is currently running. So just to sum up what we've looked at today, we've explored the Soviet ambition to get a person to the moon, the huge technical complexities involved, and the ultimately tragic series of failures with the N-1 rocket. And the separate but eventually canceled Zond program, which was aiming for a crude flyby of the moon. And all the different reasons, technical, political, and, and economic, why the Soviet Union didn't land a person on the moon. You, our listener, should now have a much better and more complete understanding of this fascinating period in space exploration. It wasn't just a simple race to the finish. It was really complicated. A mix of incredible technological ambitions, strong political will, and in the case of the N1, some significant engineering hurdles that they couldn't overcome. On that thought-provoking note, here's something to consider. Given how big the challenges were for the Soviet lunar program, and how some of the basic N1 technology was used in later rockets, what might their lunar exploration have been like if the N1 had even been a little bit successful in the beginning? What other paths might they have chosen? And how might that have changed the course of space exploration for all of us? It's a really interesting what-if to think about. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>